I don't always preach from up here, but when we have people in the balcony, they can't see when I preach from the floor, so on Sundays like this, I move up here, and I uh, hope that's okay with you. I mean, if it wasn't, that doesn't matter, but I still got to do it. You know, this is the most important Sunday of the year, what we do here, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in these next few moments, what I want to do is explain the resurrection and why it's so important, and then at the end, give you a chance to make a response, a commitment. Um, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Often, and I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the service, that often we do these greetings here at New Covenant, and where we welcome each other, we practice this 510 link rule, and uh, sometimes we'll say to each other, well, hey, what's new? Or what are you pumped up about? Or what's changing in your life? And it's always fun and exciting when somebody tells us some exciting news. Anybody who attends here regularly knows uh, Jay Smith. He's our associate. Jay came on as the associate pastor last summer. Uh, and he's doing a great job. He's a, a much-loved part of our ministry team here. And not long ago, uh, two or three weeks ago, uh, Jay and Natalie sent out an email, and they asked us to pray with them. Uh, they've been foster parents, and they uh, have got this cute little guy that they've grown to this idea of adoption. And so they asked us to pray they were going to court to ask the parents to relinquish their rights, and they wanted us to pray. And so a lot of us did, and guess what? It happened. The parents relinquished their rights, and so Jay is one of the most energized, vital guys I know, and they're excited about this new venture, this new part of their lives is heading toward adoption. They're looking for a bigger house because they're working on a larger family. And if you were to ask Jay Smith what's new, he would give you a whole lot of exciting things that's going on in his life. If you ask a bored, cynical person what's new, generally the answer is, ah, nothing. Same old, same old. Same old, same old. And actually, that response is an ancient, is kind of an ancient worldview that was happening at the time that Scripture was being written and evolved. Let me just share one verse. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, it says, All things are worrisome. More than one can say, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun same old, same old. There was a group of 12 ordinary people. Uh, some of them were fishermen, tax collectors. And if you ask them what's new, they would give you the same kind of answer. It's representative of that worldview. Nah, nothing. Same old, same old. Until one day, they met this guy out of the blue, in a sense. His name was Jesus, and he invited them. He called them to follow him, and for three years, everybody that asked them, hey, what's new? There was an excitement in their response, and their response was, Jesus, you can't believe this guy. Every day, Jesus said this or did that or went there. He touched a leper. He cleansed the temple. He healed a blind man. He partied with tax collectors. He prayed for a prostitute. He cursed a fig tree. He calmed a storm. He walked on water. And for three years, anytime anybody would ask them, what's new? Immediately they would say, it's Jesus. That's what's new. Until one day, a Friday, What's new? They killed him. It's over. He's dead. And then the next day, Saturday, what's new? Nothing. 
nothing. For the first time since they had met Jesus, nothing was new under the sun, the same old, same old, until the next day, Sunday. What's new? Everything is new. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Death is defeated. Sin is forgiven. Hope wins. Hell loses. What's new? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Now here's the thing. It wasn't just with him, was it? When Jesus Christ was resurrected out of the tomb, some of that resurrection power got into his followers. And when it did, it gave them a new life, a new sense of purpose, a new direction. Seven weeks after the resurrection came what's called the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came on those gathered in the upper room. It says in Acts 2, 5, Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. This is a big deal. It was like a holiday. It's sort of like Oklahoma City during... Uh, the memorial marathon, the streets are closed, people take off work, it's crowded, people are celebrating. The crowd, it's in the city, they've gathered from all over the place. And we're told in that passage, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, addressed the crowd. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the backstory because this is an amazing because just two months prior, when Jesus was crucified, when he was arrested, all of the disciples scattered. They were scared to death. They were afraid that what happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. And so they scattered. And not only that, this guy that's standing up that I just read about, Peter, he denied knowing Jesus three times. And now, two months later, in the very same city, with the very same crowd, the mob, that killed Jesus, and the same Peter that denied Jesus three times, now he's risking his life. What's changed? What's new? Well, Peter's telling them. Listen to what he said. People of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. The crowd's thinking, I think I remember him. I think I remember his teaching. I heard him once. I saw him heal a person one day. I watched him lead this band of followers. And Peter goes on. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death. The scared Peter, scared of the crowd that was yelling, crucify him, crucify him, now Peter's standing up to the same crowd. And he's pointing, in a sense, a finger. And he's saying, you crucified him. Everybody has heard about this. And many folks in the crowd that were when, there when Jesus was crucified are there today. And Peter demonstrates this amazing courage, and he stands up, and he says, you put him to death. You all did this with the help of wicked men and Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers were standing there too. And Peter goes on, he says, but God raised him from the dead freeing him from agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Death has raised this Jesus to life and we are the witnesses to that fact. Resurrection, the resurrection is the most important thing that's happened in human history. It's one of the unique aspects of the faith that we represent of Christianity. And the thing that distinguishes it is you can pick and know the very day it started, the very place it started, and the very person with whom it started. It has a definite starting point. This is not true with Judaism or Buddhism or Islam or a lot of other religions or philosophies. 
Christianity started in a place on a day in a moment with one man. On Saturday, it didn't exist. On Sunday, it did exist. What's new? Christianity didn't rise out of a wonderful ethical teaching. It didn't evolve with meaning, a meaningful philosophy of life. We're not the result of wishful thinking. It wasn't born out of a mistaken autopsy report. The disciples were clear on what happened to Jesus. Warren Wiersbe uh, used to write a column for Christianity Today, and somebody responded, or wrote in, and he responded, and this somebody asked him, said, our preacher said on Sunday, Jesus just fainted or swooned on the cross, and the disciples nurtured him back to health. What do you think? Sincerely bewildered. That's the way they signed it, Bewildered. Wiersbe wrote back and said, Dear Bewildered, beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails with 39 heavy strokes, nail him to a cross, hang him, hang him in the sun for three hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, put him in an airless tomb for, for 36 hours and see what happens. Some people think that in a pre-scientific era, the disciples missed Jesus so much that they experienced his presence in some kind of mystical way. They felt like his spirit was somehow with them. And so these stories of an empty tomb, they suppose, they suppose developed over the years as kind of a legend or a myth, or they symbolize some higher truth about human hope in some way. The problem is, as I see it, is nobody signs up for suffering, persecution, and death. If we created a volunteer position here at New Covenant, we said, hey, look, we're looking for volunteers. Here's the, here's the job description. We want somebody willing to suffer, be persecuted, and then put to death. I have, there's not many volunteers that come forth. There's not many disciples that would sign up for that either. As a matter of historical record, in this service of a myth, they understood that to be false. The emphasis of the resurrection accounts were based on what? They were based on eyewitnesses. They weren't poetic metaphors that were running through the New Testament. Let me give you an example. This is out of the Gospel of Mark, okay? Mark 15. Mark wrote this. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. There is my question for you. Why would Mark list those names in the middle of his gospel? What's the purpose for that? Well, one reason. One of his sources would have said, this man Simon of Cyrene, that was a source. And when the gospel was written, Simon's sons, Alexander and Rufus, were still alive. And Mark is saying basically, look, if you don't believe what, I'm, what I've written here, you go to Rufus and Alexander and you ask them if our eyewitness is not accurate. In biblical literature, an eyewitness Witness was like a documentation and a thesis. It was like a footnote that referenced some source of authority. And Mark is saying, this is our authority. And Peter got up and started talking about this unique reality of Jesus coming alive out of the tomb, coming alive. God, it says this, God raised this Jesus to life. And we are not here sharers of a mystical feeling, not tellers of an ancient legend, Peter says we are eyewitnesses to what's happened. We're telling you what we've seen and what we've experienced. And he explains in the face of this great crowd, this danger that now he's risking his life, risking imprisonment, risking the possibility of them killing him like they did Jesus, he gets up and he says, when the people, it says here, when the people heard this, 
they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Did I tell you that Jay and Natalie are looking for a larger house at the beginning? Did you catch that? Jay was telling us this week that they've been looking and they put their house up for sale. And where is Jay? And it sold like in how many? 72 hours? So you weren't, they weren't expected to sell that quick. So their house sold. And so they've really been looking. You know what I'm saying? And so they found this house. Ideal. Stretched them a little bit, but perfect. Fit what their needs were. Fit what their vision was. They fell in love with this house. Talked it over. Probably prayed about it, knowing them. And they made an offer to the owner. And then they waited. And they waited. And the deadline came. And they didn't get a call. So they called them. And the guy said, well, somebody made us a $2,000 greater offer. And they said, you didn't even call us. You didn't even give us a chance. They missed this great opportunity that they dreamed of and hoped for. If you've got a house for sale, let them know. In those moments, it cuts us to the heart, doesn't it? Maybe a lot of you have experienced something similar. And the crowd realized that this man Jesus was a great opportunity. And they had an opportunity to know and love and follow him. And they're cut to the heart because they realize that they've missed an opportunity of a lifetime. And so they ask the disciples, what what shall we do? What are we going to do? What can we do now? Is it too late? Is there nothing we can do? And Peter replies, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, in his power and his love and his presence, be ba- repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Let me say something here. Repentance means starting again. It means beginning again. Repentance means this. I realize and confess that I can't always manage my life. I can't handle my will. I can't clean up my act. I can't stand before a holy God on my own merit. Things are kind of messed up. One of my favorite stories, maybe some of you heard me tell this before, is about Lance Webb. Lance Webb was a bishop in the United Methodist Church, and he grew up in the South, and He said when he grew up, he said on this particular Sunday, it was Easter Sunday, and his mom had gotten him ready for church and put him in a white suit. And she said she took her finger and she shook it in my face. It said, Lance, don't you get that suit dirty or I'm going to spank you. And that particular Sunday was like it was this morning when we got up. It had rained the night before. And he said at their house, any time it rained, there was a mud mud hole that formed right in the front yard. And he said he had jumped it a hundred times. And he said it just felt like to him that it would be more significant and more fun to jump it in his white suit than in his play clothes. And so he said he got back and he started running and he said he, he would have made it, but that last step, he stepped in some mud and he just fell face down and slid through that mud hole. And he said when he got up, this mud was covering the front of that white suit. He said, I knew what was coming. He said, I ran in the house. My mom saw me, and I said, Mama, whip me big and love me good. And he said, she did just that. She said, she grabbed me, and she said, Lance, I want you to know that I want you to grow up to be a respectable and responsible young man and that I'm doing this because I love you and this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And she said she spanked me and I cried. And then he said she did this amazing thing. He said she took, she was already dressed for church and she took her arms and wrapped them around me and drew me in and loved me to quiet my cry. He said, when I kind of settled down, she took me by the shoulders and held me out to look me in the eye to make sure 
that, she, that I understood she loved me. And he said, when she did, what I didn't know is I tried to brush the mud off the front, but when I went through the mud hole, I had mud all over my back too. And when she put her arms around me, she had mud all over her sleeves and on the front of her. And he said, I started crying again. And he said, she held me and said, Lance, my dress doesn't matter. You are what matters. And she said, I want you to know I love you. And he said, she pulled me back in to herself and loved me again until I stopped crying. And here's a guy that's the, a bishop of the United Methodist Church. And he said, in that moment, in that very moment, he said, I realized for the first time that my mother loved me and that I had a God in heaven that loved me as well and accepted me. And our God is willing to draw all of us into himself. And here's what I know. I know this world is a dirty place. There's evil in this world. And when we live in it, sometimes we get tainted. Sometimes we get soiled and stained by this world. And sometimes we don't know what to do. See, to repent means this. It's an acknowledgement, God, I've sinned, my soul is stained, and I can't clean myself up. And there's a humility involved in this. We have to humble ourselves and understand that God is providing us grace and he's willing to pull us in. If we're willing to trust in Christ, God pulls us in as our forgiver and as my leader and as my friend. And I'm surrendering when we do this, when we repent, we're saying, God, I am surrendering my will over to you and I commit my life, my purpose, my death, my destiny to this risen man, Jesus Christ. Paul said when we do this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. That passage I read at the beginning, Romans 8, 11, says when the Spirit of God lives in us, we have new life. It involves a commitment as the first step. And Paul invited, or Peter invited these guys on this day to repent, make a commitment, and be baptized. And what I want you to know is I told Jay, I said, let's fire, so we're, we're one of the few Methodist churches that have a baptismal pool back here. And I thought, I ought to invite people who's never been baptized that way to be baptized. Then I thought this morning, well, I didn't provide you any gown or shorts or anything, and it might be kind of awkward for you to be baptized in your Easter clothes. But I want you to know I'm that serious. But fortunately, we have another opportunity, the baptismal font. And the point is that when Peter told this story, when he preached on the day of Pentecost, it was about Jesus, but it was about commitment. And that commitment was about a immediate obedience and in a sense he was saying this to those people that he wanted them to understand I'll do something someday I mean this is what they're thinking the crowd I'll do something someday when I get around to it I'll schedule it when it's convenient or when I feel like doing it maybe I'll take a class and Peter's saying no you can't put this off any longer Immediate obedience. And so when we come to the end of this sermon and the end, looking at the end of Peter's sermon, what he's saying is, I want to give you a chance to make a commitment to Jesus. And some of you are thinking, well, I thought this was a Methodist church. Don't they offer a class before you do anything like that? Well, I want you to know you're just taking the class this morning. This is the class. And some of you are thinking, well, I don't want to make anything public. That's embarrassing to go before people. Let me give you an illustration. What if my wife's not here today? We've had our daughter. She's helping our daughter who's been sick down in Austin. But what if when I asked Beverly to marry me when we were engaged, 
What if I said to her something like this? Bev, I want us to get married, and I want to commit myself to you, but I want this to kind of be a private deal between you and I. I don't want any service, or I don't want any people there and no rings. Uh, I just don't want, you know, to be embarrassed and go before a bunch of people and for people to know about that. Now, let me tell you that if I had done that, guess what? There would be three fewer children, seven fewer grandchildren, and one less marriage in this world. I can't imagine facing Jesus someday and saying, you know, I believe in you and I claim your forgiveness on the cross and I expect eternity from you when I die. But when it comes to taking this first step of obedience and making a commitment, you know, I think I'm going to wait. I'm going to take a pass on that. Or you may be thinking, I don't know about making a commitment here because I've been going to some other church and and I want you to know that we're not sure we want you to make a connection here either. I'm kind of joking about that, but, but this is not about membership. This is about your commitment to Jesus Christ. And it's about you saying, I have decided to follow this man Jesus, and I don't care who knows. And as a matter of fact, I'd like for everybody to know who I am as a follower of Jesus. And so this morning, I'm inviting you to pray a prayer like this at the end. See if this could be your prayer. God, today on this Easter Sunday, I want to humble myself. I want to confess my sin. I want to let you know that I think I've messed up parts of my life, and I need you. God, I ask you today to for, for your forgiveness and your grace through Jesus Christ, who died to show his love for me, and I commit my life from this day forward to the risen Christ as my leader, my forgiver, and my friend. Let me share with you in closing this. Now, you can make that commitment by coming and praying. If you want me to pray with you, I can. If communion would help you seal that, we have four stations for communion, two in the back and two up here, four places, that you can come and receive that symbol of grace and mercy through the sacrament of Holy Communion. I'm calling you to commit yourself to Christ. Don't let this be just a holiday. Let it be a spiritual day of making a decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Let us stand as we make our response and we invite you to come.